The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So this morning I'd like to give a, a talk, a very topical talk. I'm sure many people think about this or, you know, you do hear a lot about it, which is the, the subject I thought for today is why is the world in the state it is in? Why is the world in the state it is in? I think many people ask that question, don't they? They, they uh, look at the world and uh, they, they think, wow, well, oh my goodness, it's, is it getting worse? Do people think it's getting worse? Many people think it's getting worse. And uh, I'm not so sure. I think at all times, when you read the, the Buddha's uh, discourses, these are suttas, you know, his teachings, and also the vinaya, this is the rules of discipline for the monks and nuns. You see people doing all sorts of things. You think nobody would do that with a fully enlightened being around who can read minds and know what's going on. But they did, and all manner of things that, uh, you know, even today I think would be somewhat shocking. But I think one of the things we have today, and maybe things are declining, you know, certainly I think values are declining, one could say. And certainly uh, the influence of religion, often values and religion go together. And they don't have to, but uh, they tend to. So one could say that. But I think the state of the world now is probably not that. The, 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 the background to it is probably not that different from the time of the Buddha. The, the causes and conditions for the things that were happening at the time of the Buddha are the same as are happening now. People may not, may not agree with that. But I think what's different now is we know so much more. And what's more, we can see the video of things happening just when they happen, whatever it is. So we have a lot more exposure to what's going on in the world. And many people find that actually quite negative, don't they? You know, because we see all these violence and we see uh, um, terrible things happening. Uh, on the internet and uh, through television and everything. But really, this, this time in history is actually a really important time because even though greed, hatred and delusion are still with us, and they were there at the time of the Buddha, these days we face, uh, the world is facing two very big challenges, which are make or break, aren't they? Make or break. And that's the environment when climate change, that's make or break. <laughs> and also nuclear war, if that happens, that's make or break. So even though greed, hatred and delusion were around at the time of the Buddha, there was wars, there were atrocities, there were massacres, there were all these sorts of things. There were intrigues, people tried to kill the Buddha even. But it wasn't going to lead to the end of uh, the human species necessarily. It wasn't going to lead to the end of the world as we know it. It's quite interesting. Some people say to me in a very detached way, you know, well, maybe we're facing another extinction of another species. Homo sapiens, human beings. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's pretty detached. So, but this is uh, what we find. You know, these two things I feel are very, very important things to face. They are the ones that are threatening us. And sure, I think there are declining ethical standards, as I mentioned, you know, because often ethics, this sense of what's right and wrong, is associated with religion. And to, a to quite a large extent, particularly in the West, religion is going down. And so those ethical standards can go down as well. And also some political ideologies reject ethics as well. And certainly we can see in this world, you know, a lot of um, the mental suffering that's happening in the world is, is pretty obvious to people. Um, it's getting depressing, isn't it? <laughs> getting depressing. But this, it's true, people's reaction to when they know so much, their reaction can either be depression or anger. So you can see a lot of that. And, uh, you know, I witness, even here as a monk, you know, I hear people you know, talking about what's going on in Sri Lanka and they can get very angry and upset and, and all these sort of... It doesn't matter where you are, it's the same. Or they can get very depressed about it. 
And it gives rise to the problems of depression is a very big problem in the world, I think, but anxiety is also another one. And what's, what is a worrying indication of the difficulties of the world, the lack of wisdom in the world, is suicide rates are going up. As far as I understand, they're going up. And it's very sad when we see young people uh, you know, committing suicide. And it's, it's, it's largely because of a lack of you know, values, a lack of wisdom and lack of experience at that time. And the Buddha had a very nice, he had very nice images for what we experience here. I was going to get the, the passage and quote from it, but I, I didn't have time. But he talked about how our existence is like we are blinded by ignorance. We don't know. And we are fettered, we are imprisoned by craving, wanting, which we think is going to bring happiness. And we hurry and we rush and hurry through samsara, this endless cycle of rebirths again and again and again because we don't know what's going on we haven't got a, the bigger picture as as we say and we think that this uh, wanting this craving it's our friend it's going to bring us happiness it's going to bring us fulfillment and of course all it brings us is a new life <laughs> and, and many disappointments actually along the way but when uh, the other thing that i've reflected on, on a more positive positive side when when people uh, came to the Buddha and they heard his teachings, usually for the first time, they often would you know, say, sadhu, 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 and then they'd give this standard passage where they'd say, ah, it's like you're pointing out the way to someone who's lost. Something that was upside down, you've righted it up, you've put it up the right way. It's like uh, someone who's in the dark, you've brought a light that shows a person who can see, who has got eyes, what's going on. And this is very much what the, the Buddhist teaching is doing, but it's doing it from wisdom. As I mentioned, the, the really, I mean, you could say it's a very simplistic way of looking at our current situation, but it goes to the heart of it, really, that it's uh, greed, hatred and delusion are the villains of the peace. Last week, I gave a talk on greed. Is greed, uh, good, greed is good. Is that true? <laughs> which is quite a challenge for Buddhists because you just think, greed is good? What? <laughs> <coughs> and I mentioned last, last week, you know, I'll talk about each of those. Um, I'm doing it for the teens group because I think that, that age group, these are very important sort of areas for them to sort of get a, pick, get a handle on, we say, handle on. So I will deal with hatred and delusion in more detail. But... Part of delusion, delusion actually is, you know, people say, well, what is delusion? You know, then we have an ignorance about delusion already, isn't it? It's a vague term, actually. But delusion is that uh, it is ignorance. It's not seeing things, not knowing how things are. And uh, it enables, it makes us, um, it enables greed, it enables hatred. Because we think there are things that are worth being greedy for. We think there are things that are worth hating. We have to, we have to do something. We've got to protect, we have to fight. And so hatred and greed are enabled by this quality of delusion. And I'll go into a lot of uh, detail when I talk about delusion. Um, but basically delusion, uh, as I'll talk about in, in now, is is the opposite of right view. It's opposite of wisdom. It's the opposite of understanding how things really are. And a big part of that is right view. We hear about right view in Buddhism a lot. You know, this is a samaditi. And in actual fact, it's really what made the Bodhisattva, the Buddha, was the right view, the wisdom that he developed, that he experienced. He wasn't doing it as a theory or as a philosophy. Recently people have been telling me, oh, Buddhism is a philosophy, it's not a religion. And I said, it's neither, it's a way of life. Because <laughs> I think philosophers, they talk about or think about things a lot, but do they actually do it? I don't know. You know, I may be ignorant of the way of philosophy, but that's what I feel. Some wonderful thoughts, but does it translate into action? And religion always buys into rituals and things like that, not necessarily leading to understanding. But practice is what uh, something, a way of life, 
is something we put into practice. So this is what the Buddha is interested in. The trouble with the Buddha's teaching is that they're so beautiful and so philosophically satisfying that people can just be satisfied with that level because everything hangs together so well, fits together so well. So there can be that degree of intellectual satisfaction, intellectual happiness with the Buddha's teaching. But the Buddha would say that's not enough. <laughs> An example, of course, is, you know, like, you know, the Dhammapada verse about the spoon that's stirring the soup. It never tastes the soup. And in the way, so in the same way, someone who uh, has an intellectual understanding of the teachings and really enjoys that is not really tasting the soup, which comes from actually practicing the Buddha's teachings. And so the Buddha said, and this is... You know, if you wonder how people would do what they do in the world, you know, and you think of all these terrorist attacks. I gave a talk on terrorism and, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka after, shortly after the uh, bombings in uh, Sri Lanka where some uh, hotels were blown up and some churches were blown up. And of course, you know, how can people do a thing like that? Because they have a wrong view of how things are. They think this is a good thing to do. Amazing, isn't it? Extraordinary. Most people, even if they don't have a religion, couldn't think like that. <laughs> How can you do something terrible like that and get a good result? It's a very odd way of thinking. And I myself thought when I heard the news, I thought, my goodness, those suicide bombers are in for a surprise <laughs> when they blow themselves up. You know, the next thing, they'll find themselves in a state that matches the state of their mind, matches the state of their actions this carnage, this destruction. And so in Buddhism we'd say that's definitely a quick way to a hell state. If, and it's creating hell on earth, so it's a good beginning for the next life. So, But the Buddha said, and I think this bears out what I was just saying, at, that there is no single factor so responsible for the arising of unwholesome states as wrong view that makes wrong actions like terrorist bombings possible and many other things, wars, and no factor so helpful for the arising of wholesome states as right view. And then he says, there is no single factor so responsible for the suffering of living beings as wrong view, and no factor so potent in promoting the good of living beings as right view. So where we are coming from is so important uh, to how we act, how we speak in the world. And this is so fundamental, but it's so often we don't really look at uh, what, what our views are. They're almost buried in our minds. They've almost become a part of our landscapes, you know, the landscape of our minds. So we don't see them. These attitudes, these assumptions about life, uh, are, are very deep. They're sort of, they're very deep beliefs. They're not shallow beliefs. They may have been things that we learnt in childhood, that we believe about the world. We don't. We haven't actually tested them often, and we haven't really looked at them and gone into them. But these views uh, determine, to a large extent, how we experience the world, the way we look at it. If we have a negative view of humanity and the potential for humanity to solve its problems, the world's going to look very dark, very depressing. So these things, uh, view is very important for us. It would be good if we could get a better word in English for it, wouldn't it? That uh, Belief comes quite close to it, I think. Uh, that's not bad. It's more than an opinion, because opinion uh, seems very superficial. But an assumption is closer to it, I think, yeah, that we run on. And uh, I always like to point out, too, that the Buddha, when he became enlightened, this is what he experienced, wasn't it? Before he was, uh, when he was on the way to enlightenment, he saw his past lives. He saw the way beings pass on due to their actions in this life to another life. He saw these things from his own experience. And as I mentioned, the Buddha is not mentioning the th these things as a theory. They are his experience of reality. They may not be our experience of reality, not yet. But he's encouraging us to look in these areas. 
So he is giving us the, the full picture, the big picture from an enlightened being's mind. And it's very important to also understand right, when we say right view, some people, actually now I don't feel it so much, you know, think, oh, what's so right about right view? It sounds a bit exclusive, doesn't it? You know? And I remember the first time I heard of right view was when, I, I wasn't a Buddhist then, I think it was 1977 in Malaysia in a temple and I saw they had the uh, Noble Eightfold Path written down and it's right view and uh, right uh, thought and right speech. And I thought, what makes this right? Because we have an idea of in, uh, in, in, in the West quite often that right and wrong are very relative terms. Right and wrong are very relative terms. So for me, I said, right, right, right. And I think, well, you know, surely you can't say that for everyone. <laughs> but... As I practiced, and as my understanding deepened, I don't realize it's right in the sense that it leads to awakening. It's right in the sense that it's a complete or a full uh, description of, say, uh, view. Um, so in those senses, it's, it is a use, it's more of a functional definition. It's not saying right, you know, because often we think right is better than somebody else. It's a one-upmanship too. So... This is, uh, this is the point of it, that it leads, it's right for awakening. If you want to become enlightened, good, then practice this path. If you don't want to, you don't need to practice it. <laughs> so, And it's very important because uh, this right view too is, as I say, for us it's a representation of reality. For the Buddha, it was an experience. And as Buddhists, you know, uh, it may, it's not, it's not our necessarily our experience. Some of it we can experience, actually. Some of it we can understand already in this life. But uh, as we develop the, the path, we understand more and more of it and become our experience, too. It's not just brainwashing. The Buddha really encouraged us to investigate these things. You know, he wasn't into belief is not enough. Belief is not enough. But we must have a certain confidence in order to undertake the teachings. And to, the Buddha is giving us the areas to look in. So we will look at uh, right view in a minute, actually, some of the parts of right view. I usually say that uh, it's right view is like a reality check. You know, If we find there's a lot of suffering and difficulty in our life, it just, it's good for us to check up in what way we are in opposition to reality, what's happening, what's going on in our life. Because that's really what, you know, all these uh, difficulties we experience in life are all about. You know, just seeing where we, uh, you know, are not able to, to see reality for what it is and to deal with it in, a, in the best possible way. And of course this teaching, I'll mention it later, is the essence of the Four Noble Truths. That we, we have problems and difficulties, and, but we don't know the solution, the, the origin of these difficulties. We think it's wanting things to be the way we want, or trying to get rid of things that we don't want. And in actual fact, that's causing the problem. But that's, that's a teaching that the Buddha gave, and that the Buddhas, all the Buddhas teach, actually. And it's something that for many of us is you know, counterintuitive because as I say, we think wanting, craving, desiring is our best friend and it's going to deliver what we want, happiness <laughs> and what we're looking for in life. So this is also, the, you know, the um, right view is also the meaning of life. You know, people are always looking for meaning and meaning of life the meaning and purpose in life. And the right view is pointing us towards that, actually. And it's a road map of the we need to travel in terms of wisdom, the sorts of areas we can develop insights into, and the sorts of areas that will be helpful for us to become enlightened. So as I say, there's two, two types of view the Buddha talked about, the right view, so uh, that's samaditi, and then of course the wrong view, michaditi. It's quite interesting, the Buddha taught that there's a Noble Eightfold Path, and there's the sama, like sama, the right Noble Eightfold Path, and then there's micha, 
noble eight, uh, eightfold path. It's not noble. <laughs> it's the wrong uh, eightfold path. So this is the wrong view and right view. Right view is the experience of the Buddha, his experience, uh, experience of reality and leads to awakening. Wrong view isn't coming from understanding reality as it is. It's out of step with it. And a very good check for wrong view is it'll bring problems in our lives. We'll find difficulties in our lives. There'll be a lot of shoulds or it shouldn't in our lives. These words, when we use should a lot or when we use shouldn't, it's a good indicator we're out of, key, out of uh, tune with reality actually because we're trying to demand that life should be like this and, uh, and it isn't. And it's that famous story of Ajahn Chah's, which I'm sure you've heard many, many times, of the monk in Thailand, New Zealand monk, who had a bad, bad knees from a, a motorbike accident when he was young, and uh, he had an operation for it. And the doctor said, you know, in a few weeks, you will, the pain will go down. You should be walking within two weeks. I think they tried to get them walking sooner now. And uh, two weeks came, and of course, <laughs> he was still in pain, and he wasn't walking. And then Ajahn Chah came to him and uh, he, this monk complained bitterly. He said, oh, it shouldn't be like this. They said oh, I'd be walking, I'd be out of pain, you know. And Ajahn Chah, being Ajahn Chah, doesn't say the thing, things you'd like him to say. Poor thing, yes, poor dear, yeah, you'll, you'll get better, don't worry. He said, if it shouldn't be like this, it wouldn't be like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's so simple, isn't it? So simple. If it shouldn't be like this, it wouldn't be like this. We don't think like that, actually. So that's the difference, you know, of a, uh, that a, well, we think an enlightened being has. You know, their, their angle on reality really cuts through what is great suffering for us. It's like his advice to Ajahn Brahm when he was sick. You remember that one? He, was, he had this uh, ty typhus fever, a typhus fever. He was very high fever and incredibly weak and, and just so feeble and everything, very painful as well. And Dajan Chah came to see him. What did he say? You know, you'll get better, don't worry, you'll be all right. He just said to him, you'll either die or you'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not what you want to hear. When you, go to the, when you go to the hospital, you don't want to have somebody say, well, you'll either die or you'll get better. You want something a little bit more reassuring in between. So... The usual description, we haven't even got to right view, there's, of, there's a lot to right view actually, there are many levels of it, but the standard view, uh, standard uh, presentation of right view, they often call it a mundane right view, they have this in the commentaries, Lokia they call it, I, know, I don't like this at all actually, because far from mon mundane, because mundane sounds like something everybody would, would, would understand or know, which is not the case. So. And Bhikkhu Bodhi has a nice description of it. He says that it's giving and offering, this is right view, uh, offering alms have ethical significance. Good and bad deeds produce their like results. One has a duty to look after one's mother and father. There is rebirth and a world beyond this one. Religious teachers can be found to expound the truth about the world from their own realization. So that's the areas of right view. So it's um, giving, dana is there, uh, karma is there, you know, the uh, results of good and bad actions of body, speech and mind. Mother and father are there um, and rebirth is there. There is another world. There's not, this is not the only world. This is not a one-off experience. And th there are religious teachers who have experienced the truth, they've understood it and teach from that realization. That's the essence of right view. So I'd like to talk a little bit about this because, you know, the uh, wrong view is the opposite to this. So people often may think, you know, giving, uh, giving is a very important thing, dana is a very important thing in Buddhism, you know, every day almost with the when people bring food at the breakfast and the, the lunch, I'm mentioning giving dana. And to me, you know, really, the whole of the Buddha's path is a form of giving. It's a form of giving, you know, from whether it be food or 
um, robes that like I'm wearing, whether it be shelter, you know, kutis at Newbury, whether it be medicines in time of sickness, whether it be advice you give to other people, whether it be support you give to somebody who's in a difficult time, listening to them. Uh, it can be many things. And of course, the highest form of giving, what's the highest form? We always say it. <laughs> hmm? Mm. It's true. Meditation is a form of giving because we develop the mind in good qualities. That's a gift to ourselves and to others. But I was thinking of uh, um, samadhanang, dhammadhanang, jinati. This is the highest gift is the gift of dhamma because that's the gift of understanding, of wisdom, seeing things, seeing through things, having an explanation for what we're experiencing and understanding. So giving is really, really important. You know, one cannot, I think, uh, underestimate the power of giving. And... What's more, I think it's one of the best antidepressants. <laughs> when you give, if you give of yourself, you know, and this is what they, you know, psychologists and others recommend. You know, if, you, if you're feeling depressed, to be able to give something to others is a wonderful thing to bring happiness to oneself, to, to uh, reduce the depression and create. Giving creates a sense of connection to other people. Giving is what is a wonderful antidote for difficult situations you've had with people, angry, when you've got angry with people, upset with people, and later a gift or a kind word or a smile can be such a gift to that person and help repair difficult relationships. So gifts and giving is a very important part of life, um, an important part of Buddhism. And of course, when we give, giving is also the direct antidote to wanting things for ourselves, this sort of concern for what we can get out of, out of life, which creates a lot of uh, pressure for us and a lot of disappointments, actually. <laughs> that's the, that's what the uh, craving, what wanting. Usually it's promising a lot, but often it disappoints us. And giving is the opposite. It's going in the opposite direction. We're not thinking of what we want. We're not thinking, I need this, I need that. I want this, I want that. I like this, I don't like that. We're giving, so we're thinking of others. The direction is away from this self-concern, this individualism that we find in society. So this dana, giving, is very important, but to move on. And I mentioned last year I gave two talks, I think, on parents. But in Buddhism, and you know, I say to people, the in the right view, Samanditi, the Buddha's mentioning parents. That's extraordinary. You know, that the, he is putting such an emphasis on parents, the significance of parents, the importance of parents. And I think this is something, just to see that he mentions it in right view as, as a, uh, the way we see the world is putting a lot of emphasis on, emphasis on that. And so this is a, a very, something we find, say, in, in the society in the West, it's not emphasized, you know, because if you have an idea that you've only got this life, you've been born in this life, then, you know, however it turns out, you can either blame or praise your parents, that's the uh, um, nurture, or you can uh, blame or praise nature, you know, the DNA, this is how they look at life. In If you've only got one life, if you've just come into this life, that's how you look at it. So what tends to happen, mother and father get blamed a lot. <laughs> They're the villains, must be, must be, only, you know, came into this life, you know, and if you have the idea a baby is, uh, you know, just a, a blank space, you know, and so then mother and father are really responsible for the condition of that baby, well, the condition that baby turns into, the parent, the adult that child turns into, the teenager that child turns into as it grows up. And of course from Buddhism that's not the case. We say that we've all come from previous lives, countless previous lives, and we've brought our conditioning with, with us. So this conditioning has also linked us to our parents 
Often you may you, you can hear in the West children say to their parents, I didn't ask to be born to you. <laughs> you know, great exasperation. You know. I don't know what the parents I don't know what the answer to that is. <laughs> probably hard luck, actually. <laughs> That's probably the answer. I don't know what I'd say if I was a parent in that condition that situation. <laughs> But, but of course in Buddhism we say, no, that's not true. You did. Desire, tanha, this uh, wanting, this craving, this brought us to this life, this brought us to the parents we have. So there's a strong connection there. So this is a very important uh, relationship, probably one of the most important in our lives. And so the Buddha you know, encouraged us to support our parents in whatever way we can. And the best support, he said, of course, you know, of course, there's the physical side of things, you know, looking after them financially and making sure they have enough uh, food, clothing and shelter, etc. Just the requisites, the necessities of life. But the best thing for him was to establish them in the Dhamma, to give them the gift of the Dhamma, so that if they were um, parents that didn't, that were stingy, to encourage them in generosity, if they're not, if they were parents, our parents are not wise to try and encourage them towards wisdom. If they don't have uh, confidence in a teaching like the Buddhism to develop, to help them develop that confidence. So all these things, and most importantly, if the, it's a, it's wonderful when you read it in the Buddhist text. If you have immoral parents, <laughs> to develop them, in, uh, to encourage them, to establish them in sila, that's our, 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 a very good gift we can give to them. And this is the Buddha was saying. But really, uh, as time's going on, karma is one of the also right part of right view. And some people don't have an idea of karma, do they? These days people have more of an idea of karma, I think. There's more acceptance. Do you think so? Do you think, yeah, I think there is. There's many different understandings of karma and certainly the idea that it's destiny, it's fate, is not a Buddhist idea, actually. But karma is uh, part of, you know, the fact that everything comes from a cause and condition that we experience in this life, comes from a cause and condition. And... Karma is one of those aspects of conditioning uh, that we can see. And so when the Buddha is talking about, uh, um, in terms of right view, karma, it's just knowing that whatever positive, wholesome things we do say or think will give rise to a result of a similar nature, a positive result. Anything we do with a negative, unwholesome mind state any speech, any action will give rise to a result of a similar nature. It's a very simple concept, actually, very simple concept. But how many people really run on that? How many, how many of us understand that, really, at its depth? And for the Buddha, one of the most, for me too, actually, for my practice, one of the most important aspects of right view is knowing the unwholesome, the negative, and the root of the unwholesome, the negative, and knowing the, the, the wholesome or the positive, and the root of the wholesome or positive. You, it seems so obvious, doesn't it, that, you know, surely, surely people know the difference between good and bad, but is that the case? Really? I wonder, because we see the actions we can, we can undertake by body and speech, we may think from our point of view they're good, but afterwards we can reflect very easily that they were not good, actually. And one of the big, one of the problems that makes this difficult is this sense of self, isn't it? It's me, I, me and mine. And it, it, we, when we, um, that, that makes it difficult. But also the biggest problem, and I always I'm saying this, I say it often actually, is uh, when we feel right. When we feel right, we can do, say, anything. We can do and say anything. And one of the things people don't actually also um, don't take into account is that we make karma by the way we think. And it's pretty obvious after a while, you know, if you can see, if you think in a negative way, this will condition negative mind states. This can, can condition depression anxiety, jealousy, anger, rage, hatred, all these things. 
And uh, the good thing with Buddhism is we say it's up to you <laughs> what you develop, whether you develop positive things or, unho or negative things. But I'll just read a little bit uh, from um, uh, Venerable Sariputta about right view and the wholesome and the unwholesome. Just a little bit, maybe not all of it. When, friends, a noble disciple understands the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, in that way he is one of right view, or she is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. So this is not a small thing. He's talking about someone who has reached the first stage of enlightenment. That's usually what we call unwavering confidence in the, the Dhamma. Because why? Why is it unwavering? They know for themselves. <laughs> they don't have to believe in anything. They don't have to think that maybe the Buddha was enlightened, maybe the Dhamma is true, maybe the Sangha has, some of them are enlightened. They know from their own experience because they have reached that first stage of enlightenment. And I, w I will mention this because it links up with what we did before, you know, when we took the, the precepts. And what, friends, is the unwholesome? What is the root of the unwholesome? And what is the wholesome? And what is the root of the wholesome? Killing living beings is unwholesome. Taking what is not given, this is good for translation actually, for people who are wondering what it was about. Killing living beings is unwholesome. Taking what is not given is unwholesome. Misconduct in sexual, uh, sexual, mis sexual misconduct is unwholesome. Malicious speech is unwholesome. Harsh speech is unwholesome. Gossip is unwholesome. Covetous covetousness, this is like envy, jealousy, is unwholesome. Ill will, this is anger, all these negative states, is unwholesome. Wrong view is unwholesome. This is called the unwholesome. So that gives you an, an idea, a now, yes, and what is the root of, all, of the unwholesome? What is the root of all this? And he says, the Buddha says, greed is the root of the unwholesome. Hate is the root of the unwholesome. Delusion is the root of the unwholesome. This is called the root of the unwholesome. And of course, the wholesome is the opposite, you know. But this is so, so important because from karma, if you understand there are consequences of our actions by body and by speech and in our mind, then one will undertake, will think it is worth undertaking this sealer. And this sealer is very much a protection. I say if, you w if we wish to have a really difficult life full of conflict and a complex life, break sealer. <laughs> it's a, sh a sure way to live a very, very complicated and difficult life with quite a lot of suffering. And we see that in society, actually. So sealer is very much our protection. And uh, Venerable Sariputta ends and he says, when a noble disciple has thus understood the, the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome, that's the negative and where it's coming from, the root, the wholesome, and the root of the wholesome, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. This is like part of greed, part of greed, isn't it? He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. This is part of hate. He d uproots the underlying tendency to the view and conceit, I am. This is the view, I am better than other people that I encounter, the same as other people or worse than other people abandons this comparing and by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge he here or she here uh, and now makes an end of suffering in that way too a noble disciple is one of right view whose view is straight who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma so that's somebody who's actually realized it so there is no, no longer really right view, it's just it's become part of their experience, isn't it, in a sense? It is part of who they are. So karma is a very important aspect of, of right view, but so is rebirth too. And as surprising as it may be, uh, there are teachers who downplay karma and rebirth. And I, I've, I've seen a debate with uh, 
that Ajahn Brahman with one of these teachers. And it's really interesting. It's really interesting to see. You know, I found it quite, quite uh, um, extraordinary actually that somebody could say that karma and rebirth are not really core parts of the Buddha's teaching. You know, um, and they have various arguments for it. But to me, in the end, it sort of indicates a lack of confidence in the Buddha as an enlightened being, <laughs> who may have seen more than we have. You know, that's basically it. We, we, we do take on confidence, on faith. But uh, this person, uh, you know, some people who teach like that obviously don't have that confidence. But rebirth is very important because uh, often people have the idea in this, uh, and I'm sure you've encountered people, many people have it, I had it, you know, that this life is it. And after, when it finishes, it's all over, it's finished. And of course, when you have that sort of uh, point of view, that it can lead to, you, well, you know, uh, um, thinking, well, whatever leads to my pleasure, that's good. Whatever doesn't, um, you know, is not good. And it can lead to the fact that one doesn't care about the ethical values one has in life. If we want, if we want to get pleasure, we'll go for it. We can, can do what we like. Because at the end of the, the day, when we die, it doesn't matter because it's all finished. It's all finished. So someone who has the view that the life, this life is a one-off and when it finishes, it's all finished, you know, they're less likely to undertake a spiritual path because they think, well, what's the point? <laughs> you know, uh, maybe you can experience the happiness in this life. That is the point, actually. You can actually experience happiness in this life by understanding this body and mind, for sure. And actually that is uh, part of the reason that even people who believe in one life only, they can see that, you know, if they reflect on it, that being good, having doing good things, saying good things, thinking in a good way, leads to happiness. That's not, not difficult to see. So we do, do come across people who have a sense of know what's good and bad even though they tend they believe that it's the end of the story is when when they die but the other way it often as i mentioned before it leads can lead to this hedonism you know this word hedonism this belief that life the purpose of life is to get as much pleasure out of it as possible <laughs> By whatever means possible, you know. So seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. All the experience is a big thing, isn't it? You, to, people often say that life, uh, purpose of life is to experience. And usually they're talking about traveling to see things, uh, you know, listening to music, watching videos, um, tasting wonderful food, all these things, all the sense pleasures. This is what usually they're referring to. And of course this leads away. When we look for our happiness out there in sight, smells, tastes and touches, we forget actually the happiness is coming. Where is it coming from? In here. These things are not inherently beautiful. We have that saying in English, don't we? Beauty is uh, in the eye of the beholder. So it's coming from us actually. So uh, this is a very important thing to see that when uh, we have that idea of, you know, life is to just for pleasure, then we will tend not to look for the happiness within, we'll tend not to go there. And also just to finish off, uh, that there are spiritual teachers who have realized the truth, that's the other aspect of right view. And of course, the Buddha is the one that we're focusing on today. and. Uh, the Buddha's teachings and this is part of the wisdom he gave us is this right view that uh, I'm talking about today and there are many aspects of that particularly that things are impermanent uh, this body and mind are impermanent and because of that we cannot cannot find this permanent happiness in this world in in the world of the senses this is called dukkha unsatisfactoriness and because uh, all things that have come into existence are impermanent cannot last there is no abiding permanent self uh, in this process it's all changing of course that's not to say 
we don't that we don't have personalities we don't have habits we don't have characteristics that's for sure but they're changing and they're not permanent there's no core to it so this is what the Buddha is teaching us uh, the wisdom of Anicca, Dukkha and Anatta but also the Four Noble Truths is the very very important aspect of right view that there is unsatisfactoriness in this life anybody here who would argue with that are there, you know, sometimes if you say suffering, people say, oh, no, 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 life's not suffering. But if you, if you say unsatisfactoriness, it's much easier for people to see because that word dukkha, the first noble truth, is actually like an umbrella term, isn't it? And it goes from just mild unsatisfactoriness, not getting what we want, to extreme situations of suffering. But also the Buddha was teaching the second noble truth, where's all these problems coming from? And he's and is, is telling us, is again and again, it's coming from our wanting, wanting this, wanting to get rid of that. Simple, isn't it? But how many of us have really woken up to that? The actual fact, the difficulties in our life is because we want things to be other than they are, as other than what we're experiencing. They shouldn't be like this, that's what we're thinking. <laughs> So this is the second noble truth that the Buddha taught. And really, when we practice these noble truths, they bring a lot of uh, uh, peace to the mind. They bring a lot of uh, balance to the mind. And I know um, Ajahn Sumedho, if you've heard of him, uh, an American monk who used to live in England, now living in Thailand. He, it seems like a big part of his practice is just seeing everything, all his experience through the lens of Dhamma through the Four Noble Truths. So this is, they're very useful in daily life. So when we encounter a problem, you know, it's very good for us just to stop and say, what do I want? What am I wanting that's causing the problem? What am I wanting to get rid of that's causing the problem? Just to see it in the, from the, the focus of Dhamma. This is Dhamma Nupassana. This is part of Satipatthana just to ask ourselves, to look at our lives. Because our lives are really, you know, they're, they're dhamma unfolding if we have got the, got the understanding to see it in that way. So this is very helpful, you know, when we're experiencing difficulties in our lives, problems, to ask that, what do I want? And, or what do I want to get rid of? You know, it's, it goes both ways. Sometimes you want things, but other times you want to get rid of things. And this is the Buddha talked about not getting what we want. He called that dukkha, not getting what we want. It's a very good way of describing it. And of course, the third noble truth, and this is a solution for all of us, is to give up that wanting or wanting to get rid of. Let go of it, even if we can only let go of it for a moment, and experience peace. <laughs> Once the fight is finished, the struggle is finished, when we're struggling, fighting with reality, it's, we're going to lose, that's for sure. But if we, if we can let go of that wanting it to be other than it is at the moment, or trying to get rid of uh, uh, something, then we come to peace. And then the Buddha said the fourth noble truth is the way to do it, you know, how to liberate ourselves to use these four noble truths how to practice the Four Noble Truths in our daily life. So, and the first one, right view. And it's so important for how we view the world, how we view Dhamma. So I'd like to finish here and just to encourage everyone, myself included, to see how precious this right view is. We don't really appreciate how lucky we are, how fortunate we are to have that bigger picture that so many people don't have and that the world that most people live in doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. You know, why is it like it is? This is the, <laughs> the title of the talk, actually. Because for them, they haven't got this extra information, this view from an enlightened mind, this view from someone standing outside of our seemingly complex experience of humanity, being a human being. And we have that picture, that perspective of an enlightened being. That's the great value of, an, of a Buddha and uh, these beings that become enlightened, monks, nuns, lay people who become enlightened. They can step out and they can tell us, you know, what's really the situation and give us a few hints. 
And of course, the, the Buddha being the Buddha, it's not enough to believe, wow, fantastic, sadhu, sadhu, <laughs> he, he did it, he did it. That was his wisdom, that was his peace, that was his uh, liberation. It's not ours. So we have to walk the path, we have to investigate things to, in order to liberate ourselves, to liberate the mind. And we liberate the mind from greed, hatred and delusion. We liberate the mind from being born again and again and again. We liberate the mind from all dukkha, from all unsatisfactoriness. This is what the Buddha, all Buddhas, are offering for us. So we are very, very fortunate. We've heard about this. We're very, very lucky. We've got a window on reality that most people don't have. So may we travel that path, may we investigate that path, and may we experience it, realize it for ourselves. So I'd like to finish there. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So now, just a time for. Is that, are there any questions? One or two? I hope that was useful. Well, there we are. <coughs> So hopefully you have now got an idea of why the world is as it is. <laughs> I'm sure you all have your ideas of why it is as it is, but uh, this is, you know, p uh, from perspective of the Buddha, from my own perspective and from the perspective of the Buddha. Yeah. Ajahn, we have two questions. The yes, first question is, how, how can I know if my spiritual aspiration is not driven by delusion itself? For example, using too much mm. wanting, Mm -hmm. force or willpower? Mm. Yes, that's a very good question. How can I know if my spiritual life is being delusion. driven by, aspiration, sorry, is being driven by delusion? And uh, of course, I think all, you know, aspirations are usually positive things, aren't they? You know, like we have the aspiration to practice Buddhism, to practice dana, sila, and we say bhavana, cultivating the mind develop meditation, develop the insights and become liberated. And we have to, in order to do that, of course, we need a desire to do it. It's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? And sometimes the Buddha would talk about not tanha. Tanha is always a negative. It's always craving um, or wanting. Um, but he would talk about chanda. Chanda has got its desire it's another word for desire. It's very interesting in Buddhism. There are so many words in, in the, the Pali vocabulary for mental states, for mental fine distinctions between mental states. We don't have them in English because we're not focused on the mind so much. But we have this uh, chanda, which can be a positive thing. Wanting to become enlightened is a positive thing. But eventually, of course, you know, on that path, if we have to give up that desire too along the way. But it gets us on the path, it gets us to practice. And the way we can know if our aspirations are leading uh, to, uh, are fueled by delusion, are coming from delusion, is the result of what, how we're practicing. This is always the way we can check up with our practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's very simple. <laughs> It's always checking to see, is this a positive thing that's coming up in my life or a negative thing? Are the results that I'm experiencing positive or negative? If they are negative, if for instance one is putting in too much effort, too much striving, too much willpower into the meditation, one will see the results because the meditation, there'll be tension in the mind, one won't feel relaxed, um, the uh, peace may not be possible, there may be more, some restlessness, all these things. So one checks up from one's experience. Is this leading to more wholesome states, leading to more positive states or not? And then from that to, to adjust the practice. And the famous example, isn't it, is the simile of the lute. Venerable's <coughs> advice to Venerable Sona. He <laughs> it was a, uh, came from a very, he was a monk at the time of the Buddha. And he was the foremost in uh, striving uh, and you could say really overdoing it. <laughs> he was overdoing it. But he came from a very wealthy family and 
according to the uh, commentary, so I don't think it's in the Buddhist teaching, he even had, this is bizarre for me, hair on the soles of his feet. And they said it was because he was so used to being carried around. <laughs> we came from a very wealthy family. He didn't walk. So that these hairs developed. I thought that's really peculiar. <laughs> but he made up for it when he became a monk because he, he, got conf he heard the Buddha's teachings, got confidence or faith, and then he ordained, he went forth, is, which is the, the usual sequence, often the usual sequence. And then he overdid it. He was just he was doing walking meditation day and night. And as you would expect, well, I would expect, with these rather delicate feet, they were very. They turned and started to get damaged and started to bleed, and it was really painful for him. But he he kept up this this practice. And then after when it became too much, he thought, well, I'm not up to it. I might as well disrobe. <laughs> and uh, go back to the lay life and do good. I'll do good, you know, I can support the Buddha and Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha and so on. And the Buddha could, somehow was aware of his mind and he came to, to uh, Venerable Sona and he said, Sona, did you ever play a lute? You know, these are stringed instruments. And he said, uh, what happens when the, when the strings are really tight? And Venerable Sona said, well, it's a terrible sound. You know, is it, it's not the good pitch. You say not a good pitch, not a good sound. And then the Buddha said, "Well, what happens when the strings are very loose?" He said, "Oh, that's terrible too. You know, you don't get a very good sound at all." And he said, "In the same way, Sona, balance your practice. Not too tense, not too tight, and not too loose." And this very practical advice for him. You know, to he said to use the meditation object or subject that he was using, maybe the walking but to do it with a very balanced way, not too tight, and not too loose. And this is true for our lives. So this is, this is some uh, advice that the Buddha gave about how we can tell whether our aspirations are being driven by delusion. Basically, we'll get suffering, dukkha, <laughs> unsatisfactoriness, and we'll have to start to think, what to do, what's happening, you know, and then we'll we can work out whether it's a positive thing or it's a well it's obviously a negative thing in that case then we can make the adjustments yeah. so thank you thank you where was that one from? was that from melbourne or it's always interesting to me no, doesn't say oh. the question. second question is what is the subtle difference between letting go and letting be oh right especially regarding unpleasant thoughts or painful sensations. Right, yeah, yeah. What's the difference between letting go and letting be? It's uh, probably just a few letters. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but no, there is, I think there is a bit of difference, you know, because the trouble with letting go is that it sounds like something we're doing, doesn't it? It sounds a bit too active. When you say letting be, it, it's much more passive, you know, the sense where I just let things be. But actually letting go is pretty much that, allowing things to be as they are. Um, but maybe letting go can also be more active in the sense, as particularly in sila, when we say no to things. And when we, uh, that is a, that's a possibility. We say no to things. You know, we see um, something on the internet that looks very attractive, as most many things do, and we, we think, oh, I'll go to that. And, but we know, uh uh it probably won't lead to anything good, so we can say no to it. But when we say no to things in Buddhism, in Sila, we, we, we're saying no from happiness, from the sense that if I say yes, it'll actually lead to problems and unhappiness. If I say no, that's actually say, uh, protecting me and leading to happiness. So we're letting go. So there is some active forms of letting go uh, that to hinge on being able to say no, actually. This is a very important quality to restrain, refrain, not go, not do that thing. So the, the big difference to me is letting be is uh, perhaps more passive, but they come, they come down in meditation to a very similar ability. You know, when we let go, we are actually in tune with the third noble truth, which is we're letting go of wanting things to be different from what they are, you know. We're letting go of, in meditation, well, you know, I'm restless, um, you know, maybe the body's painful and we're reacting to that, or um, 
there can be doubts going. Letting go of these things means that we are letting go of that wanting things to be. I don't want to be restless. I don't want to be these other states. And we let go of that. And when we let go of that, then the mind can come to peace. Then the fight is over. So this is letting go and letting be. They're very similar, but I always like letting be, actually. It's more my character. <laughs> because letting go sounds too, too active, in a way, in a, in a meditation, in terms of meditation. So thank you very much for that question. And now it's... Is that it? I think that's it. While the microphone's here, can I ask a question as well? Yes, certainly. It's just quarter two. Yes. Uh, you talked at the, st at the start of the talk, you talked about um, it shouldn't, shouldn't be. And I understand yeah. there's a, like a resistance um, yeah. to what is happening in life. Mm. At, yes. And drags you out of the present moment. Mm. But at the <laughs> same time, there's been a lot of positive change that has happened out mm. of mm. the shouldn'ts. If you look at movements yeah, such as the Me Too movement, um, corruption, mm -hmm. um, many positive changes that have happened in society as a result of that. So mm -hmm. when is it appropriate for the shouldn't? When, when is the shouldn't appropriate? Right. I think uh, in those cases you're quite right. When there's injustices happening, um, things like that, like Me Too and so forth, are a good response to it. But the first thing is to realize that at the moment they are like this. That's, that's, that's the reality. And it's really when we fight with reality and say it shouldn't be like this at this moment that there is a problem that we cannot come to peace in the present moment. However, we can always you know, take action in the future, go towards something that is better if we can contribute to something, uh, a better plan of action. Uh, can help with a with a problem in society, then we should. Uh, there we are. We should <laughs> should do it. No, we should. But uh, in the sense that uh, very very important, this comes back to a very central issue to regarding activism too. Is it is good to take action? You know, when we uh, we see something that is not right, we consider is not right. And if we have a positive, something positive to offer, that's very good. However, one of the things that is a trap for activists of every type, actually, is that they can come from a place that is not good, not wholesome. Many activists I was talking to, I've been talking the last few days about it, come from a, a sense of ill will, a hatred. They're using the energy of having an issue to, to, to get energy to, to fight this, uh, they talk about fighting this injustice and so on. And often, I remember, it was really lovely, one of uh, a Quaker friend of mine was talking to me about some peace activists, peace activists, and she said, she said to me, my goodness, they were the most unpeaceful people I know. <laughs> said, they were so, so fired up. And uh, I've heard this about some environmentalists too, that they can be so fired up that it's coming from a sense of anger. And that is not a very useful, it's not a good means to an end, not a good means to an end. It's always good if we can come from non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. And non-delusion, the biggest of course is ourselves, you know, sometimes the sense of me and I and who I am, and this is my cause, I'm pushing it, I'm identified with it. So I don't know if that answered it. I think some people may like that and may not like that answer, actually. But So it's, a, it's important, yes, that we address and uh, problems that come up. And uh, I was talking about climate change last, uh, last week and what we can do. So, you no, know, it is important we do something, but we do it from a wholesome state of mind, a positive state of mind, um, uh, to achieve a good end, a good outcome. So that's what I would say, yes. But in meditation, particularly, and when we're developing sati, mindfulness, we need not, we have to, we, the shoulds and the shouldn'ts, don't apply because we're talking about the experience of the present. That's here. It's arrived as it is. So that's a that's the situation that uh, these shoulds and shouldn'ts just disturb that present moment. We're in a fight with reality, you know. So um, that's in a meditation context. In a social context, it's more difficult. And I think that's a good question actually. But we must, you know, as uh, 
spiritual practitioners do what we can do, you know, within our scope. And it's a very important thing that we should do. And I'm very impressed, you know, I think, from Buddhist terms, that uh, someone like Greta Thunberg, who's doing a lot on climate change, there's an enormous karma for her to be able to be the person at the moment who can create a lot of awareness about climate change. Hopefully more positive, <laughs> positive than negative. I hear that she has her critics. I, I didn't realize quite a few critics. So, uh, but, uh, so um, yes, we must do what we can and within our capabilities, but to do it in a wholesome way. So when I saw Greta Thunberg doing the, giving the UN um, address and she was so angry, <laughs> shaking, I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know. I thought, you know, the, part, of, uh, part of our lives is the message is, is the means we're using to achieve things. But I think she was perhaps, I hope, trying to make an impression. She certainly made an impression. And I thought, my goodness, it was amazing that she could keep it together. When you're very angry, it's very hard <laughs> to get words together, to hold it together. So she did, she did quite a good job. So thank you for that, Sriju. Yeah, thank you.